Great. So my name is Kelly Ryan, and I'm the Development Vice President on IBM in our AI Applications Business Unit, and blockchain is part of our business unit. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be hosting this, and I have, I have some incredibly impressive people here, uh, and I just want to do a quick introduction, and then from there we'll get right into um, this panel. So first, uh, I want to welcome Rakesh Mohan um, to this panel. And for those of you who do not know Rakesh, he is not only the Hyperledger Governing Board member, but he also works with me and he is the director of IBM Blockchain Development uh, within IBM. On top of this, we have Chris Ferris. Um, Chris, besides being known for the dogs barking in the background, uh, Chris is an IBM fellow. He's the CTO for IBM Open Technologies, uh, and he was a former member of the Hyperledger Governing Board. We also have our Arnaud Loors, and Arnaud, uh, you're the Hyperledger TSC Chair, and you're also a senior technical staff member within IBM, uh, within Open Technologies. And then finally, we have Ellie, on and Ellie is a distinguished engineer from our research team. And so, and, and by the way, Ellie's based in Zurich. So thank you, Ellie, uh, for being able to make this call. And, and, and this is an incredibly impressive panel. And what we wanna talk to you about and really have a panel session on is the IBM announcements that were recently made earlier today. Um, pretty exciting announcements, in fact. Uh, one has to do with our uh, Hyperledger offering, our operations console offering that we're going to come out with later on this year. And also that there's been a number of different um, code contributions that have been made uh, by IBM, IBM Research, uh, that we really want to talk about in this panel. Um, so with this, first, by the way, welcome to the IBM team, but also, you know, let's talk about these offerings. And, and while we're doing that, I want to encourage everybody that's here on the chat and questions. We're pretty flexible on how we do this. Uh, we want this to be as open as possible. Uh, so with this, I'll start and I'll go to Chris. Um, Chris, you know, I will say that you're the grandfather of Hyperledger. Um, and, you know, you must be excited in what you've seen today in terms of where we are and not only where we are, but, you know, where we're going. Um, so give us your perspectives on these uh, two announcements. So, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I, I helped to uh, work with the Linux Foundation to actually get Hyperledger up and running. And I, I chaired the uh, technical steering committee for the first uh, three years and, uh, and, and shepherded on the, the initial contribution that IBM made of uh, our open blockchain platform um, which became Hyperledger Fabric when we uh, collaborated with uh, digital assets to, to sort of create a, uh, a shared offering that we could start with. Um, and, uh, you know, to put sort of into context the, 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 the new contributions that have just been made, um, I think it's almost on an equal footing with the original Hyperledger Fabric uh, contribution. Uh, you know, over the years, we've uh, actually almost completely rewritten Hyperledger Fabric 0.6 that we we started with. Um, uh, and we so so now we actually have, you know, the the BFT offering in the labs. We have the token capabilities now contributed to the labs. We have uh, and most recently with the the UI, I think, you know, this is this is almost as important as the initial contribution, if not more. Um, I think, you know, the, the, the console is going to be really important because I think the most challenging part of working with Hyperledger Fabric is that it, it doesn't come with sort of a, a, it has a user manual, obviously, but it doesn't really come with, uh, you know, something that makes it easy to use and consume from an from a end user perspective. Uh, and now it does. And I think that's really wonderful. Great. Thank you, Chris. You know, it, it is exciting when you think of the user perspective. If we really want this all to be successful with regards to Hyperledger Fabric, we have to make it easy to consume. We have to take it to the next level. Arno, what's, what's your perspective here? 
Yeah, so, you know, I've been following the, uh, participating in the development of Fabric for several years from the beginning uh, of Hyperledger. And, uh, you know, when I look at all the changes that have been happening over the years, I kind of like to think of them as different categories. I call them axes of development of Fabric. And so there are things like, you know, we've been increasing, uh, improving privacy and confidentiality, uh, performance, uh, serviceability, ease of use, that kind of stuff, right? And there are there are quite a few of those. And what I'm excited about is I think, you know, a lot of those contributions, and there are actually quite a few labs that we have actually uh, uh, contributed to Hyperledger over the last several months that fall into that category. And they're actually moving the needle on several of those axes quite significantly, which I think is very exciting. Now, I noticed, Chris, you had a question here. Can you distinguish what you mean between a contribution and an offering? And so what we're referring to uh, is there were two announcements that IBM uh, made earlier today uh, with Kareem Youssef in his keynote. One was an offering where we are offering uh, a through the Red Hat Marketplace the support for our open source contribution, which will be, which is the Hyperledger op console. I think uh, Rakesh, correct me if I'm wrong, but is it called the operational console? Yeah, the Hyperledger Fabric operations console. Right, okay. So that's gonna be the offering, Chris, uh, and we are putting that in uh, Hyperledger as an open source contribution. And then the second piece was a number of contributions that were done uh, by the research team and others, and that was related to the interoperability tokens. Uh, Arno, did I miss any in that list? Yeah, so I mean, there are quite a few. As I was saying, we had things like Mir BFT that was uh, uh, you know contributed a bit earlier, which is basically a library for BFT Byzantine fault tolerance consensus, which we plan eventually to integrate with the Fabric. And which is very nice because it's actually not limited to fabric. People right. should be able to use Mir BFT even with other technologies as well. Okay, great. Thank you. I hope that answered your question. Well, great. Thank you, Chris. Um, there, there's Elliot. actually been another question, but it was in the chat, and it's you oh. know what are the features of the console? I don't know, Rakesh, if you want to. Yeah. So let me talk about that uh, a bit. I was uh, planning to do that a little later, but uh, let me just uh, dive into it. Right, so the, uh, the console takes uh, much of the code from our IBM blockchain product uh, that is available right now. So it'll be sort of product level code. And, and it really takes away the, the uh, it reduces the problems of running, operating, deploying large fabric networks and, and, and doing that in production. So it uh, provides a, a web based uh, UI, which is very intuitive to handle and have full control on things like uh, identities, on, on channels, on smart contract, on the order. <clears throat> so for example, you can use the console and then just through the um, uh, intuitive, very intuitive user interface, be able to look at channel characteristics, join peers to channel with the appropriate uh, permissions, either the operators or writers or what have you. You can manage identities, you can add member organizations, import, export them. You can manage your certificate authority users, uh, enroll and, 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 and revoke that. Uh, you can even manage on the orders, uh, even configure who's on the consortia channel. So it, it uh, uh, provides a, a lot of deep capabilities into sort of handling all aspects of our uh, large scale uh, fabric deployment. But do it from a web UI, and, and you can have your components of the network deployed across multiple different cloud environments, even, and, and, and do this through the central play. But, but Chris, if I may, I also want to sort of put this into the picture, right, as we look at uh, what we want to provide for this frictionless experience in terms of just using Fabric, right, so people can focus on the value add applications on top. Um, it, it's so that the console provides this capability of managing your uh, uh, fabric network, as I explained, and, and people can find more details about it in our lab. 
Uh, along with that, uh, as Kelly mentioned and Kareem mentioned, we'll be uh, making this available through our Red Hat marketplace. Right? So we'll have the Fabric uh, long-term support LTS release, uh, certified and security scanned images and any patches to that also available. And an operator that automates both the one and day two operations and deploying Fabric on, on containers like uh, OpenShift. Right. So it covers that whole picture from uh, the day-to-day -day operations and, and the IT uh, sort of deployment and management uh, things, plus a support offering. So even people running open source fabric and production stacks, if they require, they can get 24-7 support right, with experts to make sure that nothing goes wrong in the production stacks. So hopefully, I, I, I know I covered a little bit more with the console, but just wanted to get yep. the picture on how it fits in with the other things. Great. Thank you very much, Rakesh. Now, I do want to do just a little bit of a twist and go over to Ellie and research. Um, Ellie, from your perspective, you know, from a research point of view, you know, you really look at what are the emerging business needs in the blockchain space, because it really then drives, you know, the work that the research team spends their time on uh, to really come up with new innovations in this particular area. So mm -hmm. from from these announcements that we've made and and give us your perspective on, on what what drove us to those particular announcements with regards to the business needs and and anything with regards to what you think is the next thing we should be working on. Sure. So my lot of um, the value proposition of blockchain as a new generation business network comes from um, its decentralization premise, distribution of trust and transaction validation, and all the transparency and more robust security that comes along. But it is this the same kind of uh, features that raise, for certain use cases, interesting privacy challenges. Um, challenges because we want to preserve enterprise data confidentiality, um, enterprise relationship uh, confidentiality, while at the same time um, guaranteeing compliance with regulation. Another um, aspect is that uh, regulation is not really the same across the same country or it's not, it's not impacting the same way um, all uh, enterprises, even in the same country. So. Um, was our, the, the work that we have contributed to the open source community, um, like Mir BFT, aims to um, make to strengthen all the decentralization aspects of blockchain system by giving them um, a scalability boost beyond the state of the art, scalability and performance. Our assets, um, our um, the work around the token SDK. Um, is a Hyperledger Fabric token SDK uh, aims to give um, privacy compliance um, with the regulation. Um, so offers audit support together with uh, privacy preserving asset exchange. Um, our interoperability work uh, aims to facilitate exchanges across different networks. Because as I mentioned, different types of regulation apply to different country, different kind of preferences, different systems, different enterprises would have with respect to the technology they would develop. And last uh, but not least, our fabric private chain code and the fabric uh, contributions to fabric private chain code and the fabric smart client aim to provide a little bit more flexibility uh, when it comes to uh, privacy options. Smart client gives us the ability to compose transactions in different ways in accordance to exquisite probably uh, privacy uh, rules um, governing a use case where the private chain, private chain code would allow us to build things in the trusted execution environment. Great. Um, thank you very much. When you step back and you think about it, you know, the pace of innovation that we're trying to provide here um, is is really to really to really drive more business use cases, uh, more areas where this technology can play a big role. Now, Rakesh, there's a question that Jennifer has here, and it says, uh, she says, the Walmart project is a big inspiration to what we need to develop. And um, so she really wants to know a little bit more about that particular project. Can you elaborate on that one? 
I'm trying to read the full question. Yeah, so it, the, right. So it, it, it is actually a product offering from IBM, which we call IBM Food Trust. Uh, Walmart is definitely one of the big uh, companies using that uh, along with its suppliers. But so are other uh, big companies uh, like uh, Albertsons, uh, Carrefour. Uh, big uh, food manufacturers like Nestle so is is much beyond um, uh, this Walmart. Although Walmart was an anchor in in, in the big name, and and it's it's really using uh, uh, blockchain in one of the specific areas about provenance and and provenance here is is powering food safety and also transparency to end consumers. So not only the platform provides uh, information about as, as Frank Yanis was mentioning yesterday, right, about uh, food recalls and safety, mm -hmm. but also the consumers uh, sort of that visibility is this organic, is this grown with my local farmer. And, and we've also now made it into a platform which we call transparent supply that others are using now to build their own ecosystem. So a, a good example is Farmer Connect, which is doing this in the coffee ecosystem. And, and uh, one of the great users there I, I see is really connecting consumers, not only with the visibility into the coffee supply chain, but actually connecting them to the farmers who usually make the smallest amount of money in the whole coffee transaction, but yet are burdened with uh, having sustainable practices and the like labor practice and not bringing the kids to the field type of things. So it's, it's really connecting them by giving a small amount of, of appreciation there, right? So, it provides that basis of transparency across the supply chain that can be used for safety, for, for uh, providing consumers better visibility into the uh, practices and uh, how the food is sourced or other things are sourced. And then we are seeing even further as, as people are looking into sustainability and, and carbon, how along with the flow of goods we can track these other things also. So, uh, as I said, the, the people can join uh, the network, or or we also sell it as a platform, and and, and that's an easy way of just using it. Uh, great, thank you, uh, Jennifer. You know, I hope that um, gave you a little bit more clarity uh, in in your question. Um, so, what I want to do now is is I want to go to each of you, and I want you to really just give one one item that you believe is the what what are what the audience should be most excited about and i would imagine each of you have your own point of view which is why i want to kind of do it a, a round table here on it but but i just want you to give one item of what you think the audience should be most excited about for all of the work that we've done so far in in our announcements and what we intend to do because i know the offering doesn't come out until later this year uh, and what we intend to do for the, the remainder of the year. So I'm going to start with Arno. Uh, let's start with yourself. What, what's that uh, so one item, like, the one key takeaway? It's your that's own like putting opinion. That's like a kid in a candy store, tell them <laughs> to choose one, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> but so I, I think the console is pretty exciting because I think, you know, people are still find it quite challenging to, to uh, you know, instantiate the network and then operate the network, manage the network. I mean, we've actually done quite a bit of effort. We have a whole new sections that was recently developed and added to the documentation of Fabric on how to actually deploy a network in production, but it still remains quite a bit of challenge. And so I think the console will provide a, 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 you know, a user interface that should make that much easier. But I will I will cheat right away and say that other than that, I think the Fabric Smart client is very interesting. I'll tell you why. Because it actually changes the level of, of, of concern. It actually moves the API higher up. And people have been lamenting for years uh, about the disappearance of another project called Composer, because Composer had this ability to provide people, the business developer, with a, 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 um, a model that was very close to their concern. And, uh, and we, we actually disbanded the, I mean, we discontinued this project. Uh, and I mean, we, Hyperledger, right? There was a consensus. And so this project has been retired, archived, and uh, people are still missing this kind of capability. And I think the Fabric Smart Client will actually bring some of this functionality back 
and people will love it. So here you go. Right. Thank you. Now you can imagine if you ever took him to the candy store, he's not going to walk away with one candy. But that was great to, to get your insights on both of those. Um, Ellie, I'll go over to you. Yeah, it's very hard to choose, but um, <laughs> I'll uh, <laughs> the same position as I know. But what I'll say is maybe choose the one that is closer to the uh, an, an existing application. Uh, so token SDK. Um, is, um, is something really that uh, can be used for uh, digitizing assets, different types of them. And the financial asset is clearly a focus because the, the first implementation of this supports fungible tokens, but it can easily be extended to the non-fungible token case. But um, also I would say uh, that this, uh, this asset alone um, uh, will not provide as much value as in combination with the rest. Um, the token SDK is built on top of Fabric Smart Client um, that allows essentially provides more flexibility in the interactions between different clients of the blockchain system it can be off chain or on chain interactions. Um, and that's exactly the capability that we are using in the token SDK side as well. Um, and near BFT, Fabric Private Chain got also com uh, completes the privacy story, complements the privacy story there using a completely different model, whereas Mir BFT gives you this decentralization flavor that is very much required in blockchain systems without taxing performance. So uh, I cannot choose any of them because... <laughs> <laughs> Another one we can't bring to the candy store. <laughs> Sorry, Kelly, I said the wrong example. Yeah, I realize it's like... You know. But no, I, I get it. I mean... Ellie, your point is by having all of these different contributions, there's a lot more flexibility, uh, which again, to me, then brings more use cases into this this particular area. And then Arno, your your point on the um, I, I I will call it the frictionless experience in terms of managing an environment. Uh, Rakesh, I'm going to go over to you next. Chris, your last, you know, being the grandfather of of Hyperledger. Uh, um, I really want to save you for the end there, but uh, Rakesh. Yeah, so I'm, it's, it's good that I'm all, already going after people who couldn't keep to one, right? And because it's, it's, <laughs> it's, like, it's started with, right? It's an embarrassment of riches. We, it's, it's a lot of contributions uh, this time. Uh, obviously, from, from a person who th runs things in production and helps clients, the console is definitely a, a big, major contribution. It, 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 takes a man years, I mean, hundreds of man years of work actually are encapsulated in it. Uh, so, so that is high. Uh, but uh, I, I would also ch choose, among other things, for example, our interoperability thing, like we were, where we all start working with other groups and, and really uh, sort of grow the community about how these different DLT technologies and even different networks can interoperate, right? So I, I think uh, that's why it's difficult to choose this. There's, there's such a rich uh, set of really key uh, contributions that we are announcing today. Okay, well, thank you, Rakesh. Over to you, Chris. <laughs> okay. Well, Ellie stole my thunder. <laughs> that's okay. You can pick the same thing. <laughs> I was going to say so, it, and it actually, it is, you know, it's interesting. So, you know, um, have, having been, you know, sort and Ellie, of course, she's been involved since the very beginning as well. But um, I would always hear about, oh my God, you know, Fabric doesn't support tokens. Oh my God, Fabric doesn't have true, you know, fully Byzantine fault tolerant consensus. Oh my God. Um, <clears throat> well, now it does. <laughs> but you really, it, it, you can't, you know, you you really couldn't put tokens in without the full BFT consensus. Because if you really wanted to use it for, you know, some, uh, you know, either to manage, you know, uh, true tokens, um, as some of the customers we've worked with uh, have tried to do, you need the full Byzantine fault tolerant aspect of things. Uh, but a lot of the use cases that we have done, um, you know, to date, as we've demonstrated, whether it's food trust, whether it's uh, trade lens, whether it's we trade. Um, they didn't need it because they aren't dealing with, you know, you know, they're not dealing with financial tokens that you're exchanging and so forth. And you're worried that somebody's going to steal all your tokens. It's more about data sharing and, 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 you know, sort of, and tracking and tracing. 
And, but now there's really no excuse. You can pretty much with the assets that we've contributed now um, in open source, you can pretty much compose any sort of use case you can think of from a blockchain perspective using Hyperledger Fabric and the various technologies. And I'm really looking forward to, <clears throat> you know, increased collaboration, you know, to, for instance, to incorporate the, the Mir BFT capabilities into the operations console so that we can actually deploy and manage a fully BFT uh, network uh, as well as one using the traditional um, consensus model that we have. So I, I think it's really pretty exciting because they, they sort of all feed off each other or build off each other and create a set of capabilities that pretty much gives us unlimited potential from a use case perspective. Now, Bob uh, Dubois has a question. His question is, isn't token SDK overlapping or interfering with um, Bezu? I hope I pronounced that right. Anyone have a point of view here? Um, um, I am uh, I'm not sure what the interference refers to. Does it mean interoperable? Um, or uh, because in terms of functionality, Token SDK offers um, a layer uh, for um, issuing, transferring, redeeming, and um, atomically exchanging uh, tokens, tokens on top of fabric. Um, it can be extended uh, to interact with other systems um, that also support tokens, but it's not uh, intermediate. It's not interfering, like offering the same type of functionality on Bazoo because uh, as Bazoo because it is referring to Fabric currently. Great, thank you. I hope um, Bob that we answered your question. Let us know on, on the chat, or sorry, on the Q&A. If I may uh, add, I mean, sure, in Hyperledger, we have many different frameworks. And so there are some overlaps in functionality between the different frameworks that are being provided. And uh, yes, of course, basically an Ethereum client does support tokens. But, uh, you know, having it in Fabric is by no means a problem. It's, it's a different framework, different uh, type of application you're going to build on it. You will have the same kind of functionality, but we also have additional features that we hope will be a differentiator, such as the privacy features that Amy was talking about earlier. And I, I would also note, because I worked on it way back when, but um, Hyperledger Fabric has had uh, um, uh, an EVM capability uh, for smart contracts uh, since, well, since 1.2, I think. So, I mean, it's been a long time um, <clears throat> that we actually finished that work. Didn't get a whole lot of use, but uh, basically, if you want to run Ethereum tokens, you can do that actually uh, using the EVM that we have in the smart contract. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Now, I know, yeah, we're, I know we're, I don't know why I'm doing an echo. Just let me. Okay, is the echo there? Uh, no, we can't hear it. Great, thank you. So I know we're we're at the end of this particular panel. Before everybody leaves, you know, our, our intent here is is really we really wanted you to all to see and really hear from us in terms of wanting to have this strong, vibrant blockchain community. And and as you can see from IBM research and from development, we are we are stepping on the gas in terms of really pushing for more contributions into Hyperledger. And I would tell everybody, you know, everybody on this call, I would all to do the same. We really believe that doing this open source Hyperledger and Hyperledger fabric community, we're really going to then drive those businesses and those use cases and that innovation uh, we want to see in this space. So again, thank you all um, here uh, for participating and thank you all for listening. I will only do one final plug and that is on June the 30th, there's going to be a webinar that will take you in, into the details of our code contributions and the offering that was announced uh, earlier this morning. And I encourage you all uh, to attend that um, to continue with all the questions that you may have. So thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.
Thank you. Thanks. Bye, guys.